Hello, my name is Konstantin Popadin, and today I start a serial of lectures about evolution. So I call them Gentle Introduction to Evolutionary and Population Genetics, and the first topic is dedicated to mutations in mitochondrial genome. So today I will try to convince you that mutations in mitochondrial genome mark aging. Let's start from Van Gogh. When we see the picture on the left, we can uh, read the name of author, Vincent Van Gogh, so we can educate ourselves that this is done by Vincent Van Gogh. But even if we see now another uh, painting without signature, we can deduce using style, colors, probably it's also done by Vincent Van Gogh. So we can use signature in a broad sense, not just a real signature, but uh, signature is a common style of the painting. And today I will try to demonstrate that the same happens in molecular evolution. But instead of signatures of paintings, we will use mutational signatures. So mutational signatures help to identify mutagen. Let's start from four nucleotides. We have in our DNA, we have A, T, G, C nucleotides, and they can mutate. A can mutate to three other nucleotides, T can mutate, etc. So we can draw 12 types of substitutions, 12 arrows. And if we analyze DNA and we count substitutions, we count mutations, 12 for numbers, or let's say 12 frequencies, this is a simple representation of mutational spectrum, uh, which demonstrates how often different nucleotide will mutate to another one, for example, A to G or C to T, etc. And when we have 12 numbers, 12 frequencies, they can mark different mutagens. For example, today we will discuss a potential effect of reactive oxygen species in nuclear genome, and uh, this substitution is called C to A. So many mutations such as C to A, they are driven by reactive oxygen species. Or if we have a lot of data, and a lot of data we, we have when we sequence the whole genome, and when we have a lot of data from cancer field, for example, we can take into account neighbor nucleotides. So, and in this case, we will have 12 basic substitutions, and we add nucleotide before and nucleotide after. So we multiply 12 by 4 and by 4. So we can get as rich, as deep as 192 numbers, which will characterize all spontaneous mutations. And in this case, we'll have a rich source of information to uh, deduce different mutagens. But in order to deduce exactly uh, as my first slide, we need to educate our computer. We, can, we, we have to educate ourselves what is the signature of different mutagens. And luckily, in the cancer field, due to huge number of empirical data, it was done already. And if we go to Cosmic Database, catalog of somatic mutations cancer, we can find 100 different signatures. For example, signature number four is uh, induced by tobacco smoking. So we can see that majority of mutations C to A, but uh, among the C to A uh, context can be important. For example, the champion, it's CCA, to CAA, yeah? so if the first nucleotide is C and the last is A, this is the highest frequency, etc. So we can see many frequencies of different types of substitutions and context is important. Also, we can have a look at another uh, mutagen, ultraviolet light, and we can see that majority of mutations are C to T, and again, if we want to find the champion, it would be T first and C last one, the TCC, to TTC. And when we take into account all types of substitutions, we trace back mutagen. Yes, so in the real data, we observe mutations, but relative frequency of different mutations will uh, let us know mutagen, which, which is behind of all these observed mutations. And this is a big deal, and uh, that's what we call mutational signatures, because they really help to identify uh, mutagen, which leads to different mutations. It's important to emphasize that our genome is not just a nuclear genome, because majority of uh, progress in mutational signatures was done in nuclear human genome, but also we have mitochondria. And mitochondrial genome is tiny. It's just 16,000 nucleotides. But it's very important 
because uh, first uh, mitochondria, this is mitochondria, so it's a little organelle which exists in all cells of our body. And in each mitochondria, there are mitochondrial genomes, which are realized here. This mitochondrial genome is semi-independent, so it can replicate uh, independently of a host cell. And during replication, uh, there are many mutations. And mitochondrial genome mutates much faster as compared to nuclear genome. So two main properties of mitochondrial genome, semi-independence and high mutation rate, defines that it can be very important for aging. So we would like to know which mutagens are behind all mitochondrial mutations. That's our main question for today. Because all progress in cancer field is related to nuclear genome. But we want to draw parallels between nuclear genome and mitochondria. And to do it, we just read textbooks and we ask ourselves, uh, what do we expect? So mitochondria is an organelle which generates ATP, so energetic molecule in our body. So we suspect that um, it can be under stress of oxidative damage. So reactive oxygen species, which are normal byproduct of uh, respiratory chain, which generates ATP inside mitochondria. And so this byproduct is chemically very active. So it can mutate DNA. So what we can do? Now we go to cosmic database and we look for signature of ROS, of reactive oxygen species. And we find it. That's signature number 18. And we see that it looks like this. So many mutations C to A and a little bit other types of mutations. Now we can have our null hypothesis. And we say, when we analyze mitochondrial mutations, if reactive oxygen species are important for mutagenesis of mitochondrial genome, we expect to see a lot of mutations C to A because they are driven by uh, oxidative damage. Okay, to test it, we use again cancer data because this is the biggest data set of somatic mutations. And uh, here we see uh, different types of cancers, uterus, steroids, stomach, skin, and uh, different types of mutations are color-coded here. So we can see that C2A mutations, there are two types of mutations, C2A on the light chain, because in mitochondrial genome, there are two chains and we analyze them separately. Light chain, this is the internal circle and heavy chain is uh, external circle. But for, for us, it's not very important. So we say C2A is expected to be a result of reactive oxygen species and all this oxidative damage should be very strong in mitochondria. And so we see how many red and yellow colors out of 100% of the whole bar of all mutations. And we see that tiny fraction. It's uh, by eye, it's less than 5%. And here we have overall cancer data set. And here we have four types of cancer separately. There is some fluctuation, but always it's tiny fraction. So we see that reactive oxygen species, maybe they affect mitochondrial genome, but uh, in very negligible um, fraction. So there are two hypotheses. Maybe in mitochondria, there is no problem with reactive oxygen species. Maybe mitochondria can deal with uh, this burden of reactive oxygen species somehow. Or in mitochondria, because it's unusual genome, it's like prokaryotic genome after symbiogenesis, Maybe rules of mutations are different, and we need to trace rules, trace mutation signatures, then NOVA. So let's have a look on all mitochondrial mutation spectra in different types of cancer. So this is the same paper by Jan et al. So we didn't see strong effect of reactive oxygen species. Yes, so red and yellow, which are C2A on light and heavy chain, they contribute a little bit to total mutation spectrum. But we can have additional um, expectation. For example, in case of skin cancers, so some portion of skin cancers, they are sun exposed. So we may expect to see effect of UV light. And we can come back to remember what is UV light. That's C2T in special context, but main idea that C2T is much more common as compared to other substitutions. Okay, we come back to cancers and we ask ourselves, do we see that C2T, 
So T to T is uh, green and light green. So there's two pretty common uh, substitutions in mitochondria. But our hypothesis is that skin cancers, maybe they have more green as compared to other cancers. And we look at this data set and we don't see difference. So stomach, thyroid, prostate, etc. So dark green plus, plus light green, that's the same. There, there, is, there are some fluctuations, of course, but we don't see any strong trend. So uh, in case of mitochondrial genome, first, we don't see expected effect of reactive oxygen species because red plus uh, yellow is too small fraction. Second, we don't see expected UV light effect because skin cancers, they do not demonstrate significantly more C to T, significantly more green substitutions. And okay, we can go for last test, tobacco smoking. So C to A, that's similar to reactive oxygen species, by the way, but now we will go to lung cancers because among lung cancers, there is a significant fraction of tobacco smokers. So we go to lung and we uh, ask ourselves, do we see that C2A, or again, red and yellow, they are more than other cancers? And we say, no, not more. It's uh, some random noise. So we don't see effects of any strong mutagens, which are well known in nuclear genome, well proved. But mitochondrial genome probably has some specific rules which we need to trace and reconstruct the NOVA. Okay, and just let me present several slides just to demonstrate that mitochondrial mutations are important. They can lead to diseases, they can lead to aging. So that's a big deal to understand which mutagen is behind of mitochondrial mutations. So for example, this... Uh, paper, Ribaleda Jaramila, we will come back to this paper several slides later, we can see that mother's age, so please pay attention to red, this uh, x-axis is maternal age, age of fertilization, and uh, y-axis is number of the novel mutations in offspring, in a child. And we can see that more young mothers, 20, 25, they contribute approximately one new mutation to offspring, but less young mothers let's say 25, 30, 35, 40, they contribute approximately two the novel mutations to offspring, yeah? So even if mitochondrial genome is very small, so it's 16,000, 16,500 nucleotides approximately, there are the novel mutations each generation, and this mutation may lead to a disease, so it depends where this mutation happened. And we don't know why there is increase in fraction and number of the novel mutations in uh, less young mothers as compared to more young mothers. Okay, the same trend we can see in somatic mitochondrial mutations, so which happens in different tissues. And this is um, work dedicated to macaque. And uh, we see different uh, tissues, oocytes, liver, heart, muscle, and everywhere there is a trend, positive trend, that uh, mutation frequency is increasing with age of her organism. And again, the question is the same. Why there is this increase? Which mutagen is behind all this? And why in liver it's higher compared to in all sites? Do we see different mutagens? No. Which mutagen? We don't know. But that's important. Uh, another good example that mitochondrial mutations are so common and uh, so frequent that we can use them just to trace cellular lineage in our body. So that's natural marker of cellular lineage. In this example, we see ancestral cell line, black dot, and after it goes to differentiation to different lines, different, let's say, petri dish. And uh, so we grow these cell lines, and after we sequence. We sequence mitochondrial genome in each petri dish, and we analyze mutations in the mitochondrial genome. And look, for example, just if we take into account one mutation, so this is substitution from C to T, on position 8003, even if we take into account just one substitution, we see that in some cellular lines, it's common enough. Sometimes it's zero. So we already can partially reconstruct original tree of cellular lineages. But if we add another mutation, this one, C2T in this position, and one more mutation and more, and we combine them all together, we perfectly can reconstruct cellular lineage. So simply speaking, if we have several cells in our body using mitochondrial somatic mutations, we can say 
how close they are to each other when they differentiated, when we were embryo or they differentiated five days ago. And if we know mutagens behind of these substitutions, look, three substitutions here, C to T, and just one G to A. So maybe it's not just neutral marker because the whole scientific community is using mitochondrial mutation still now as a neutral marker, which is a big deal, which is important to reconstruct phylogeny, for example. But if we know, for example, that C to T is a marker, it's, it's a, we can reconstruct it as a molecular clock, and G to A, for example, that's a marker of level of normoxia or level of aerobic metabolism. So in this case, uh, we can understand much more about cellular lineages. Yes, we can say this cellular lineage, because they have mutation G to A, maybe they have increased aerobic metabolism due to some reasons. So mitochondrial mutations from merely neutral marker can become very important informative source of knowledge for cellular biologist, organism biologist, population and evolutionary geneticist. Now we come to our hypothesis. We decided maybe mitochondria is a difficult object and we need to tune rules of mutagenesis agnostically, de novo. And the best way to do it, go to evolution. So we have many species and for many species we have mitochondrial genome and life history traits. So some knowledge about uh, longevity of species, about uh, basal metabolic rate, etc., And correlating genetical properties, so mutations, and ecological or physiological properties, we may find some uh, interesting results which can help us to guess nature of mutagens. That's our hypothesis. And uh, let me present four steps of logic in our project. First, we started from somatic mutations in uh, mice of different age, young and old, and human samples. And in this uh, data set of somatic mutations, we analyzed all 12 mutations. Yes, so the basic 12 probabilities of substitutions from one nucleotide to another. And we observed that A to G substitution is the only one which is robustly increasing with age of samples. So that's first our observation that A to G on heavy chain of mitochondrial genome is more common among somatic mutation of aged samples. Next, we decided to think, if A to G is more common in somatic mutation, maybe we can extend this logic to germline mutations. So from somatic tissues, we go to, to oocytes because mitochondria is transmitted only through oocytes, through maternal line. And we come back to this paper, everybody, the Jeremila. And so I don't have specific visualization, but main idea is that we just took into account all mutations of more young mothers, so here, and all mutations of less young mothers, more than 30. And we just compared fraction of substitutions A to G on the left cohort and on the right cohort. And we observed a trend that fraction of A to G is higher in this category, category of less young mothers. So it's in line with our first observation that A to G on heavy chain is more common among germline mutations in aged mothers. So first, our result was dedicated to somatic data set, and second was dedicated to germline data set. And now we decided to extend it even more. We decided, let's go to different species, the different mammalian species, because mitochondria is transmitted through oocytes, and in case of, let's say, mouse, age of oocyte will be several months, so maybe one year, but in case of whale or elephant, age of oocyte would be dozens of years. And maybe mitochondrial genome is sensitive to age of oocytes. So we decided to go to comparative species scale, and we performed analysis of polymorphic data sets. So let me explain briefly a logic of this third step. For each mammalian species, so altogether we analyzed hundreds of mammalian species, but for example, in case of elephants, we uh, downloaded from gene bank all sequenced elephants, for example, one gene, which is called the mitochondrial genome cytochrome B. And having 10 sequenced elephants, we reconstructed pedigree. So we have ancestral elephant, terminal branches elephant, and in this uh, pedigree, in this phylogenetic tree, we can reconstruct using bioinformatical tools, ancestral state of each nucleotide. 
and we just can count all substitutions. Let's say here there is a substitution from C to G, here from A to G, etc. And when we count all substitutions, we need to do some normalizations. And the most importantly, we need to take into account only substitutions which are neutral because we don't want to analyze changes in structure of cytochrome B or something. We want to work with the most neutral substitutions because our goal to understand mutagenesis, not selection. So we want to focus on places in mitochondrial genome where selection doesn't work. And we assume that synonymous substitutions, so substitutions which affect DNA, but they don't change amino acid substitution, amino acid content, uh, this is the best uh, subset of sites which are neutral. So for hundreds of mammalian species, we reconstructed phylogenetic tree, polarized and reconstructed all substitutions which are synonymous and counted them. And finally, similarly as in my previous slide, I showed you cancer data, for each mammalian species, we have 12 frequencies, 12 substitutions, so the color code is here. If you remember, it looks like similar because, for example, C to T is the most common. It's uh, the most common substitution in mammals as well as in human cancers. So mitochondrial mutation spectrum is similar enough between different species. But we, we are interested in these fluctuations, in this noise. We would like to understand, is it noise? fluctuations or there is some correlation with life history traits. So here I just show small subset of our data set. In reality, we have hundreds of mammalian species, but main idea is that we have these numbers. And now we would like to dig and uh, understand, can we correlate, for example, frequency of T to C, which is dark green, with um, longevity of different species? Or can we correlate uh, light green, which is the uh, G2A, with uh, metabolic rate, etc. So, and that's what we did. We took all 12 types of substitutions and we correlated with several well-known ecological traits of different species. And after this analysis, we observed that only one substitution demonstrates good correlation with generation length. Then this is A to G, the same substitution which demonstrated nice results on somatic and germline scales before. So let me explain first pie chart on the left. So this is just general mutation spectrum of mammals. So we have many substitutions C to T, more than half. This is the most common substitution. Second most common is A to G. And all uh, 10 additional types of substitution very rare. And the general pattern reminds cancer data set. It reminds uh, human um, de novo mutations in mitochondria. So it's pretty uh, conservative. And our mutation A to G is the second most common, this one, is increasing with generation length of mammalian species. So here, X axis is generation length. This is a log scale. So elephants and whales on the right, short-lived mammals on the left, and each dot represents one species. So on a comparative species scale, we observe the same result, frequency of substitution from A to G on heavy chain is higher among long-lived mammals. And finally, we decided to extend this logic even more. We were thinking if A to G is very common in long-lived mammals, with million years of evolution, all these neutral locations, the synonymous sites in mitochondrial genome will slowly become G-rich and A-poor. And this G-richness and A-poorness will be more pronounced in long-lived mammals. So now we counted nucleotide frequency in all protein-coding genes in mitochondrial genome. One dot is one species. X axis is again a generational X, so elephants and whales on the right, short-lived mammals on the left, and we can see that whales, so long-lived mammals, they are G-rich and A-poor, exactly what we expect if mutation A to G is more strong in long-lived species. So perfect. So on four different scales, starting from somatic mutations, which could be originated several let's say days or months ago, switching to 
the novel germline substitution in uh, human population in more young and less young mothers, and in this case, time interval of analyzed mutation would be dozens of years. Next, moving to polymorphic mutations, which were observed in different species, and uh, in this case, time interval can be hundred thousand years. And finally, coming to interspecies uh, divergence on this plot, and here we have an um, evolutionary interval in millions of years, dozens of millions of years, and um, hundreds of millions of years between the most diverged species. So on completely different uh, time scales, we observe the same trend. A to G is higher in long-lived species. So we do believe that uh, this pattern is strong and universal. And take home message for today that mitochondrial mutagenesis is not random noise. It's informative. So we can use it not only to reconstruct phylogeny, but to understand something related to ecology, physiology of different species, or something related to basal metabolic rate of different cells in our body. So this is a graphical summary. A to G is red, and we can see that this is more intensive, a more bold line in whale as compared to short-lived creature. And now, because we like to collaborate with artists, uh, we try to visualize this finding with help of my good friends, colleagues, and artists. So please enjoy uh, several slides. You can pause the video and read the description. And uh, artist contact is on the left. And uh, all these visualizations are dedicated to substitution from A to G. A in case of short-lived mammals and G in case of long-lived mammals. Okay, so probably you forgot to take home message. This is a reminder. A to G is a marker of age-associated oxidative damage. That's our working hypothesis. Of course, after this discovery, I mean, the best part in science to dream about follow-ups. How can we extend it? How we can prove it in different groups, uh, different taxa? And today I presented you this arrow between a mouse and elephant. And also we discussed uh, more young and less young mothers. So we also touched this arrow. But now in my laboratory, we extend uh, all our findings to short-lived cells in our body and long-lived cells, flying birds and non-flying birds, because here we expect to see increased aerobic battle metabolic rate. We compare all birds with all mammals, because all birds, as compared to all mammals, they uh, are characterized by increased uh, battle metabolic rate. We compare all warm-blooded vertebrates, mammals and birds, with cold-blooded species. And again, warm blood, we expect that A to G would be higher. Yes, yeah, so always uh, Y exits here is fraction of A to G. We compare uh, different ectotherms, like fishes. And fishes can live in cold water or warm water. And in this case, um, temperature of water will affect level of metabolism. And level of metabolism will affect activity of respiratory chain. And oxidative damage is normal byproduct of oxidative chain, which we can see as A to G substitution. That's our logic. Moreover, we can compare short-lived insects and long-lived insects, because uh, we can see the same. And we can switch to prokaryotic genomes, to bacteria, because mitochondria essentially is a prokaryotic genome. And we can compare aerobic bacteria and anaerobic bacteria. And uh, our null hypothesis always that more aerobic, more organisms with higher basal metabolic rate will have higher fraction of A to G substitutions. Okay, and another dream of all scientists, think about applications, how we can use it. At least always when we write grants, we, we, we try to speculate. Sometimes it's interesting. So, and here we can speculate that A to G can be marker of oxidative stress in mitochondria. And if we analyze different tissues, 
or heterogeneous cancer, different cells, we are able to estimate fraction of A to G in each cell of this heterogeneous tissue. It can be informative because increased fraction of A to G will mark cells under higher oxidative stress. Moreover, we may suspect that before mutation, so substitution from A to G, there is nucleotide modification. So adenine is just methylated. And there is this modification, N6-methyladenine, which is very common in mitochondrial genome. And so maybe if we are able to estimate this modification, so in this case, it can be much more sensitive marker of stress in mitochondria. Stress, uh, which is driven by, for example, oxidative damage. Finally, I would like to thank all co-authors, numerous co-authors from different countries. Uh, so you feel free to use this QR code to go directly to get your full version of this PDF file. Uh, thanks to consultants, collaborators, and to agency who helped to realize this project. This is abstract. And thanks a lot to my team, again, and numerous collaborators around the whole globe. And uh, see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.